President Carnahan, we're happy that you're with us. When you first arrived at uh, the college, as I remember then, Utah Technical College, uh, you had already been the what associate commissioner for, uh, for, for the regents, uh, and uh, you've been president of the Southern Utah State College. That's correct. A four-year college. Why in the world would you then even want to come to a two-year college, which uh, some people might think was almost a demotion <laughs> from a four-year <laughs> institution, and, and especially after the college had had some uh, uh, some difficulties, employee morale, fairly recently before your arrival. What made you decide you even wanted to come here? Well, probably a number of things. First of all, my background was technical education and it was community college. Before coming to Utah, I was president of Highline College up by Seattle, and prior to that, I was the chancellor of Eastern Iowa Community College District with three colleges in it. All of those are community colleges. And my own background, my bachelor's degree is as a vocational teacher. In fact, I started my teaching career as an ag teacher. And so that was my background, that still was my interest. And when I realized that I did not like the more structured bureaucracy of a state office of education, of higher education, working for the regents, the job options t to stay in Utah, which I wished to do, were somewhat limited. And uh, so I, at the suggestion of the commissioner, I applied for and, and got the job as president of what's now Southern Utah University and enjoyed it very much in, in many ways. But I had only been there a little over two years when I was approached when the changes that took place here occurred. And I was approached uh, by a number of people to see if I would be interested in coming here. Some of that was because I had previously indicated an interest. Just before becoming president of Southern Utah University, I came to the campus here and taught a class in community colleges for Utah State. And most of the class of some 25 people were teachers or administrators here at the college. In fact, when I left here, when I retired in 90, I pulled my list out and counted and there were still 14 of them at the college. So there were people I knew. Uh, I, the community college philosophy was my philosophy of education. The flexibility, the opportunity to new, do new things or do existing things in new ways just did not exist in the more structured four-year institution. And so when then Governor Scott Matheson approached me and said, would you consider it? It's a little more difficult to say no, <laughs> especially since I had some interests. If this job, when, when Jay Nelson decided to retire, if he had announced a month or six weeks earlier, I probably would have waited and applied for this job. But by the time he announced, I was a finalist as a candidate down there and so went to Southern Utah. But my interest always has been the community college since I first got into it in 1964 because it provides the kinds of education that most interest me. I was a typical community college type of a student. I started college on an athletic scholarship, didn't like college and quit after six weeks. I actually went home and went on the deer hunt and stayed a week <laughs> up in the little ranching community where I lived. 
and then didn't get back into college until I had done a lot of other things, including military in Korea and being married for three years. And I knew what I wanted, and I wanted to be involved in the kind of education that late comers like myself, I was almost 25, would be interested in. And I've always had an interest in those kinds of students, and those especially who are interested in job preparation kinds of education. So when the job was offered to me, the, only, the biggest hang-up, and I know this isn't supposed to be a, an issue, but the biggest hang-up was that the president of the college here was making about $8,000 a year less than I was. <laughs> and to my surprise, the regents, uh, George Hatch was then the chairman of the Board of Regents, and the governor and others said, would you be interested if we would match your, your salary? And I was concerned about that because I had four children in college, all four of my children in college, and uh, finances were a concern. But basically, this is the kind of a school I was interested in. It was primarily technical. So you, you arrived here when? I came on the first day of July. Actually, I came in late June because of my interest oh. of 1981. So you served uh, 10 years? Nine. Nine? I came in 81 and retired just exactly nine years later in June of 1990. And when you, you got here with, uh, uh, with all your aspirations uh, for community colleges, were, were you uh, pleased or displeased with, with what you found? Well, I was not surprised, for instance, at the quality of education because, for example, when I was president of Highline College up by SeaTac Airport just south of Seattle, one of the programs that we had was a program in welding for those who wanted to become welders in the shipyards. And uh, suddenly they started do, doing more work. What they did was they were taking the big ships that were storage container ships taking them into the dry dock and cutting them in two, stretching them out another 100 or 150 feet and welding them back together, and they needed lots of welders. So we started a 24-hour shift of welding classes up there and discovered that our welding graduates were second choice for the shipyards. The first choice were all the students they could get from some college called Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. So I became interested, and then because I did accreditation for the Northwest Association and was asked to do that in technical education, the next time I was asked to go to a college, I called down here. I knew Jay Nelson. In 1967, he taught a workshop at Utah State on vocational administration. So when I came to the state in 76, ten, almost 10 years later, and came here uh, almost 15 years later, I had known Jay for a long time. I called him and said, I'd like to come through your facilities and get an idea of what they are. They, they were fairly new here then, and was introduced to Paul Gunderson, who was then the dean of that whole complex, and spent a half a day with him here on campus. And then when I came to the state, my interest was very much this college. And it wasn't really a college then, it was a trade school, primarily because almost all the courses were vocational or technical, and almost all of them are only one year in duration. The college only had a handful of classes that went two full years. And that was a challenge to me, the idea of coming in and developing those into more extensive, and I shouldn't say just a few because there were quite a few, but the emphasis was still on the job preparation and so many of the students were just doing the one-year programs rather than staying for a two-year degree. 
that interested me. Uh, let me digress one other point. The reason I came to Utah initially was a, that an old friend, originally from Idaho, as was I, talked me into it. His name is Ted Bell. Ted was then the commissioner of education for the uh, uh, president at that time, had been assistant commissioner, associate commissioner, and then became the commissioner of education. That's before it became a, a uh, part of the, the uh, cabinet position with the president. And when I, I was interested in moving to Utah, had been, I had been here, at, got my degree at Utah State, and uh, taught ag up at the old Bingham mine. <laughs> That's when Bingham City was still there. And then went back to Idaho after one year, but always enjoyed the four years at Utah State and the year living in Midvale and teaching up there. So my wife and I had talked of coming back and uh, did so finally after almost 20 years in the Northwest. But I applied initially for the presidency of Dixie College. I attended a technical education meeting in Spokane, Washington, and uh, what's the previous president at uh, Utah Tech at, at Orem? Uh, Wilson Sorensen. Wilson Sorensen was at that meeting. And I had known Wilson for several years because we attended similar meetings, and he said, there's a job open in Utah, apply for it. And he told me about Dixie College. The president had announced for a full year in the future. And that was in 1975. And so I came to Utah, uh, was interested, applied for the job. When they made the final decision at Dixie, before they did, uh, George Hatch, who chaired the Board of Regents and the search committee, called and said, we'd like you to come to Utah, but we don't want you to go to Dixie as president. The college I was president of had about 10,000 students up by Seattle, and Dixie then only had about 1,100. He said, you come from a metropolitan area and a bigger college. Would you consider being a member of the state office of higher education? Uh, if we match the salary. <laughs> and I said I would and didn't know. That was in November of 75. And I didn't know until late in the spring of 76 that after I said yes, George Hatch went to work, had the position created and passed through the legislature, and, and it was not created until the legislative session of 76 by the legislature. But I came in that position only because Ted Bell encouraged me. I flew back to Washington, D.C. and spent several hours with him. And this is a lot of background maybe, but he wanted to create a true community college in Utah. At that time, Utah had three little junior colleges and two technical colleges and didn't even know about comprehensiveness, the real comprehensive community college. And for instance, here at this college, there was almost none of the community service, the continuing education. In fact, it was after I came to the college that the college really began building that program. And now, as you know, that's a major part of, of the college. But uh, Ted Bell and I drove in his car, an older car, we made the loop twice uh, in Washington, D.C. You know, the freeway has a complete loop around Washington, D.C. We drove that twice as we talked about the job. And I agreed that I would come to, to Utah, and he and I would see if we could truly create a community college. By the time I'd been in the state six months, we could see that the regents were not interested in that. They didn't understand it. Their primary emphasis was university education, and that's when I decided that I would look for some other opportunity, but I wanted to stay in Utah, and that's when I went to Southern Utah. You mentioned uh, just a moment ago the, 
the expansion of uh, continuing education. W would you like to to talk about that and perhaps what it was, if there was any, when you came and, and what happened? Yes, I would. When I first came to the college in 81, one of the first things I inquired about was the status of that what I would call non-credit education. The vocational and technical programs were non-credit to the extent that the, the credit hours were less than 100 and therefore not acceptable as transfer to four-year colleges or universities. But I meant that for community service. That aimed specifically at helping businesses with meeting their needs, that at developing programs of community interest and there was not much of that. In fact, the relationship between the college teachers and their counterparts in industry in their areas of expertise was not very great. You know, there were then, and the names have changed now, what they, they called advisory committees. But the advisory committees were mostly the teachers with an occasional friend from out in the industry that got together once or twice a year, maybe had lunch. And so one of my first major thrusts was to insist that every job preparation program here have an advisory committee that was a truly functioning advisory committee made up almost entirely from those in that part of the industry with the expertise so that we would know what the cutting edge needs were in job preparation. And that was uh, dental work. It's kind of like pulling teeth. <laughs> but we established it. Uh, Max Lowe was then the vice, pres vice president, uh, academic vice president. And after I finally convinced him of the value of it, uh, we started establishing them. And suddenly the success of the programs that had a real viable advisory committee was so great. They were expanding so well and doing so well that even the non-vocational and non-technical programs at the campus said we'd like to have our own advisory committees. And my understanding, well, when I left four years ago, many of them did. For instance, in English, they got people from the University of Utah uh, people out of public ed that taught English, and people from the industry to find out how important communication skills at least were, uh, speaking and writing and, and some of those things. And that's how it really began moving uh, toward the kinds of two-year programs that, that finally came of it. And then several years later, later a member of that class that I taught here on community colleges got his doctor's degree. I'm talking of Bob Beebe. And with the enthusiasm that he had, he kind of picked up on this and developed it and with some new ideas that he had gotten at Ohio State and getting his doctor's degree and developed the process now in place or was in place when I left the college that really trains these people to know what to expect, how to do their job, how to help the college, and train the college people in how to, to work with them to gain the greatest benefit. So it grew and expanded and we opened new areas. The, one of the biggest problems we had was that there were a lot of programs that people wanted here in the Salt Lake Valley that the regents wouldn't allow us to start because the program existed in one of the other colleges in the state. I might have mentioned a few of those. Uh, my old alma mater, Utah State, did not want us to teach horticulture. And we wanted to teach horticulture, uh, at least to the level of those people who are doing the landscaping and related kinds of things. And even those who have their own business mowing lawns and keeping up uh, that kind of thing, because those are those were good businesses and well-paying businesses. Well, it took three or four years to finally get that, and I just talked this morning to Elwood Zog, and he said, we're back away from it again because of their pressures. One example. 
Another example was that we, because of the airport out here, we wanted to get into airplane mechanics. And we wanted to get into training people for the other jobs out there, maybe even stewardesses. At, at Highline College where I was, we had a program that with 400 slots open for training stewardesses, one of the big programs, the successful ones. But the airplane mechanics were the biggest thing. And Dixie had an airplane mechanics and pilot training program. And that took us five years to get the regents to allow us to teach the program. And now, you know what it is. They have their own separate facility out at the airport. And when we first got the program, uh, Western Airlines had their home office here. That was just before Delta bought Western Airlines. And we had just started, they had started hiring some of our first mechanics graduates but when Delta bought the program, bought the airline and moved in, they wouldn't hire our graduates. Our graduates had to go somewhere else and get six months to a year of experience so that they knew that they were good mechanics. Now, uh, Delta Airlines hires their, automotive, or their airplane mechanics out of our program and altogether too often hires them before they've completed their degree. So, you know, just one indication that it was a very needed and very successful program. So, and there were other instances. Uh, the, the regents did not understand the concept of having someone come to the college, say in the morning, some morning and say, we have this program we'd like to get started because it'll help us in our business and having someone start teaching the class that evening. And I had seen it done outside of Utah and we now do that. That's maybe an exception, but at least we can start the programs. Whereas at Southern Utah, if we had a new program in mind, some of the ones that I initiated the idea of were not uh, approved yet by the uh, academic senate when I left. And some that had been proposed before I came still were not through the process. It was a slow, rigid process. And uh, the freedom just didn't exist that exists in a community college, if it's functioning right, to really meet the needs. I haven't talked about the needs of students yet, but that's the heart of it. Uh, the average age of students when I came to this college was 30, I think. And now, even with the tremendous increase in students right out of high school, the average age is still probably 27 or 28. Those are the students that not only want this kind of education, they're the ones that can best use it, and they're the ones that most appreciate it. Because they've been out in the world with uh, no real job skills except what they picked on, up on the job. They've had those jobs at minimum wage as uh, non-skilled workers. And so they appreciate what the education will do for them. And although a lot of that maybe is different now than it was five years or 10 years or 30 years ago, that's the heart of what my interest was. That's the kind of students I wanted to put the major emphasis on. And then I discovered that there are also a lot of those kinds of students that are not interested in going to college and becoming English majors or history majors or anything else necessary with a four-year degree and that Utah was not really serving them. A lot of them had good enough grades and enough interest that they'd go to the university and drop out, and you know this story. At one point, a year or two before I retired here, we had over 1,500 students a year of what we called reverse transfers. Many of them from the university, just from the University of Utah, 1,500 a year of reverse transfers. And then we also have hundreds of students, I'm sure that's still the case, we have hundreds of students at this college who already have a bachelor's degree, maybe a master's degree, and some of them, I met a few who already had a doctor's degree, but did not have the kinds of skills and the kind of technical or specific education that would get them a job that would help them support a family. So that's where my interest was. And as much as I loved Cedar City in southern Utah, I 
I knew all along I'd probably say yes if they asked me to come here as a president. Oh, very good. So, uh, continuing education in some instances would be a backdoor approach to, to getting new programs started for the college. That's right. Uh, but in other instances, uh, uh, perhaps a person only needed uh, relatively a few hours instruction to get a, a particular skill. Uh, so that's, that's why you have continuing education. That's right. Most of the emphasis in continuing education is in retraining or upgrading of skills and uh, sometimes they only need a class or a couple of classes or they may prefer to get their education in short spurts like a three-day workshop or a one-week workshop or once a week for a month or six weeks in a class and so to accommodate those kinds of things and not mess up the difficulties of a regular established department uh, about the only way to do it was to have the continuing education or community service program even though those classes would typically be taught by the faculty coming out of those established programs and because the faculty came out of those programs when they saw something started in develop uh, in community education in continuing education that was a good program that really fit in with what they were doing those programs were and over the years I've watched a lot of those cl single classes or whole programs that were moved right into the regular college departments as a part of their programs and that backdoor approach uh, perhaps uh, was an excellent way to build programs I don't think the college would have had the CAD CAM program for another three to five years if it had not come in that way uh, as that kind of a program. And uh, approaches to teaching, a lot of approaches to teaching. I don't know how much regular programs are now involved in this whole program with Union Pacific. But Union Pacific for its first several years was totally community. Uh, or continuing education kind of a program and yet now they're building a building on campus to accommodate it so so it was it was an excellent feeder for existing programs and an ex excellent way for them to learn new ways of upgrading what they already had in place one of the biggest concerns I have always had from long before I came to this college and I think it it still exists, it almost has to, and that is that the college gets far enough away from the industry, whatever industry it is, that we teach to obsolescence. What we're teaching no longer is the heart of what's needed by a company, by an industry, and so the biggest job we have is to try to stay on the cutting edge enough that we know when we we should discontinue something. What I call Model T vocational education. Uh, it seems to me, uh, in my memory, that you were the one who encouraged uh, uh, the process of telecourses and, and getting us into television on sort of an outreach program. Can you talk about that a little? Yes. Uh, that does come under continuing education, doesn't it? it uh, I assume that it does uh, here at the college. That was a, an area of tre tremendous interest to me. The first uh, community college that where I ever worked was Yakima Valley College in Yakima, Washington. And I was the director of vocational education. And one of the first things we did, and it was someone else's initial idea that I liked, we created our own TV studio. And back then, in by 66 or 67, that little college had its own TV studio. 
totally equipped. And the very first time we te tried telecommunications courses there, it was in conjunction with what was then Central Washington State College, it's now Central Washington University. And we tried our first ever at uh, television courses for credit. And it was so successful, we thought if we could get 100 students signed up the first time, it would pay its way enough that we could do it again, and we signed up 300 students. Well, I never lost that interest. And at Southern Utah, although there was a great deal of interest on the part of some, it was not an area of enough interest that it was developed. And so when I first came here to the college, I took time to visit Coast College in Southern California because when I called the National uh, Office of the American Association of Community and Junior Colleges, they referred me to them. I spent about a day and a half there. At the time that I went there, they had their own cable TV program and they were offering over 5,000 credits a year through telecommunications. And so I encouraged it as much as I possibly could, maybe more in at times than I should here. And that's how we really began getting into it. Kelly happened to be very interested. Others, yourself, I remember, uh, Brian. And, but it's a slow process. And it's still a slow process at the state level because even with the governor's tremendous interest in what he calls the electronic highway, and that is telecommunications of one kind or another, and telecourses, it, higher education is a conservative organization and moves very slowly with changes. But it's an area that I had a great deal of interest in and still do. I think that it will save us millions and millions of dollars in Utah in brick and mortar. We don't need to continue to build new buildings with classrooms in them if we will develop to the, the state of the art that now exists even in teaching by telecommunications. As a matter of fact, I live only two blocks from the college, three maybe. I intend to continue my education and if the facilities are available, I'll, rather than come three blocks, I'll take the courses by telecommunications, by telecourse if I can, because I'm that sold on it, especially as we get into two-way communication so that the students can better communicate with the instructors and not have just a lecture type of, of approach. I think that it will, that telecourses will be the greatest expansion in higher education and in public education in the next few years. And those few states that already have their own satellite up there or their own piece of a satellite so that they can broadcast across the nation are the ones that are fast getting into the business and are doing, they are teaching credit courses by telecourse from, well, the one I think of is housed in Nebraska and I know friends in the state of Washington that are taking courses from them, credit courses and getting the credit for them. I think it has the greatest potential of anything I'm aware of. Oh, great. A little earlier you mentioned bricks and mortar and uh, uh, the future perhaps not requiring that and yet uh, uh, as far as your tenure as president was concerned you you were heavily involved in bricks and mortar and, and particularly in, in the creation of satellite campuses. And you yes. alluded to the International Airport uh, campus uh, and, and the Sandy campus, as I remember. Uh, would you like to talk about those campuses? I'm particularly interested in how the, the Sandy campus evolved but also, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the old South High School and, and the Riverside campus. Uh, tell us about those. Yes, bricks and mortar. Uh, as much as I'd like us to see, to move more towards telecourses, we can't avoid bricks and mortar. 
like this facility right here. And one of the major comprehensive community college philosophies was that you not house everyone, everything in one location. And yet at that time in Utah, the only exception to that that I was aware of was that the University of Utah did have a continuing education center in Bountiful, not a very extensive one. With the competition from Salt Lake Community College, uh, their program is now five times what it was. And as you've maybe seen in the papers, Sandy has agreed to spend a million and a half dollars building them a structure so that they can put 2,500 University of Utah students in Sandy. Well, that was a great interest of mine. From almost the first day I arrived at the college, I began talking about uh, uh, satellite campuses or learning centers or whatever else you would call it. The college already had a couple of those. For instance, for a number of years, this college had gone to the Capitol and taught a class or classes for the state accounting office for new employees coming into there to help them with state accounting policies and procedures. There were other occasions where the college had gone into places and taught specific classes, but as far as having a second location to teach classes, and it wasn't done with the exception of the old campus. And almost the only thing that existed at the old campus was the skill center. So immediately I began encouraging all of the uh, various departments here at the college to look at having other locations. And the very first totally clearly identifiable new location was in Sandy. Uh, well, I no, the very first was at the high school uh, over on the east side. What's the name of the high school uh, that we went and uh, we contracted for one whole year for some classrooms at? The name will come to me. Anyway, we went, we, we did it for a year, but we could not, we were not compatible with the principal at the high school and we were not able to expand. In fact, he insisted that some of our students did things that would uh, teach his students bad habits. Uh, for instance, uh, a lot of our students smoked. Uh, they were adults and they smoked. Some of them, no doubt, uh, were familiar with other kinds of drugs. <laughs> the, I say that because at the end of the year, it was determined that our students had a better influence on the high school students than the high school students had on our college students. <laughs> and that was conceded to by the superintendent of, of the school district. But uh, we did that for a year. The, the concept was good. When we could no longer go there, we went to Sandy. And the Sandy City, the mayor of Sandy, and the Chamber of Commerce were immediately interested. And they did all they could to encourage us. We finally had several different locations. One time we were in their technical center. We leased two or three other locations. And finally, when a, uh, when a California company came up and bought a little strip mall at 94th South and 7th East, they came to us. They came to... Uh, Jeff, uh, or, or not Jeff, uh, our dean. Uh, uh, who is the dean now of continuing education? Jeff. Yeah, Bruger. Jeff, I was right. Jeff Bruger. They came to Jeff and said, we will provide you a facility in our shopping mall if you will consider moving there. And they gave us a price per square foot that was about half of what they were charging those who were moving in. The reason for that was that in California, having a community college campus in a large mall was very successful. In fact, the idea was initiated in Gresham, Oregon by the man who was the president that first hired me at Yakima Valley College. 
uh, he went there and developed a whole new community college district. And when they couldn't get space anywhere else, they moved into a mall and took over an old, I think it was an abandoned grocery supermarket. And it worked out so well that that suddenly became their biggest campus. But they were, they were wanting several campuses. So we jumped at the opportunity. We had grown to 500 students, I think, out there. And with that, six classroom facility that they actually built separate from the other mall, as you know, they, we jumped past 1,000 students. Sandy has continued to be very supportive of the college in any way that they could. And to that extent, we're uh, unhappy when the final decision on a 100-acre new campus was settled in West Jordan rather than in Sandy. But the idea of many campuses, I almost became the chancellor of Los Rios Community College District in Sacramento. They had three campuses, and each of the campuses had 15 to 25,000 students. Major, major uh, size campuses. And they worked well together. And so uh, all of the things that I knew about community colleges, and by then I'd been a community college president for a number of years and had as personal acquaintances hundreds of presidents across the United States that were doing all kinds of innovative things in education. And each time I heard of a new one, we'd come back and look at how it could be done here. I was up lobbying the legislature when I first heard that Salt Lake City was probably going to close South High. And I began working immediately. We had looked for years for a place down there. We, the, when the pressures were on us to sell the old uh, campus, the old laundry center, we purchased the 14 acres that had been uh, Jordan Junior High School and moved the, the skill center over there and built a new building with some of the money that we got out of the old one. But it was still just a skill center primarily. I walked through South. They still had students there. I walked through it on my own one day, went to the principals and asked if I could, and I just walked all three hallways and what came away knowing that it would be a tremendous place for another campus. And it took a year and a half to get it because of tremendous resistance. What I wanted to do, we'd have been approved $8 million for an addition onto the business building here. And I wanted to take that $8 million, if necessary, to remodel it. And the senator from out here, from south of us, was the most opposed. He had been a House member and become a Senate member, and he was the most opposed to us doing it because he wanted to build brick and mortar back out here, if possible, in his Senate district. And his Senate dis district now contains that 100 acres. But we needed a place downtown. We also needed to move the skill center because the fire marshal condemned the old building after we moved into it down there, and it was not compatible. So uh, we looked for a place that had the best bus service because we didn't think we could vi find very big parking lots. And it was perfect. And so after a year and a half of effort, we finally bought it for a million dollars and then put about $12 million into it, remodeling the first two floors and, and building on some at the back end. One of the great interests, of course, was that they had a gymnasium. And it's only been a couple of three years since we finally resisted the pressures and started a basketball team with all the controversy that that created. And we needed a good gym floor because all of these LDS basketball gymnasiums were half size. They were like the cracker box that I played basketball in as a kid in high school. So that was a great appeal. And then, of course, they had the swimming uh, down there, and we could really start expanding both PE and possibly some other competitive sports. So that was accomplished. 
uh, with uh, a great deal of effort. And we moved into it. And now I was there yesterday looking at it, parking there and looking at it. And that is worthy to be called a full-fledged campus of Salt Lake Community College, as this one out here and perhaps some others. In addition to that, we went into Davis County. And for years, this college has had a relationship with the what's now called Applied Technology Center there in Kaysville. But there in the process, they just got a million dollars from the legislature to buy 100 acres to start a community college up there. And to the greatest extent that I can, I'll convince them, if I can, that that should be a campus within Salt Lake Community College District. Because for 15 years now, I felt that there should be a campus up there. So that's a great expansion, a great potential expansion. I think this campus shouldn't grow much beyond the size it already is, especially with the brick and mortar that's going up now. The new PE facility we worked on for at least five years before I retired, and I retired four years ago, and it's just becoming uh, a reality. We're now back to where the business building expansion will occur if we can get that money, and next year maybe the legislature should approve enough money to build that addition on there. And so brick and mortar is still important. Uh, what, what about the uh, International Airport campus and uh, the Magna campus? And the Tooele campus. And Tuella, yes. yes. Uh, and we those. still are in, in, up in, in Summit, uh, well maybe we aren't. We went to the Summit County and then Utah Valley State College, as it's now named, already had a relationship up there and the regents m moved to let them have that in Park City. So we may not be up there, but all of these I think should grow, maybe not to be freestanding campuses, but I foresee the day when there will be a chancellor of the Salt Lake Community College District. This Redwood Road campus will be a campus with its own president South will be a campus with its own president. Uh, West Jordan will be a campus with its own president, just like they've done in so many places in California, Washington, Texas, uh, 15 or 20 other states. And it, will, and it should appropriately, I think, this shows my biases and my philosophy, all of it should be uh, under one uh, overall structure so that that there is the co coordination that comes from having that kind of a relationship. Would you like to come back as chancellor? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. When I retired, I couldn't believe that I would rather do anything else than being president of a community college. Four years of 2020 vision backwards <laughs> tells me that the one of the best things that ever happened to me was to finally free up my time and look at new interests. And so, although I, I value my position as President Emeritus here and want to continue a close relationship with the college, I have no desire to become a college president again. Okay. Could we take a, a break for a minute? Hi. President Carnahan, uh, uh, this is an indelicate question. Uh, there was a tremendous brouhaha uh, on campus and in the newspapers and other media uh, over the new president's house. Uh, Jay Nelson was the first president to to have uh, a president's home that was built for a, a college president at, uh, at this institution. And he'd only lived in it uh, maybe five years or so, as I remember, uh, before he, you came on the scene. Well, it may have been longer than that, five years. But, but it wasn't an old house. Why did you need a, 
a larger house and how come it became such a, an expensive proposition although um, we kept on saying it wasn't that expensive. Well, as to the president's home, let me tell you what I know about before I came to the college. Uh, the construction trades pro program did build a home uh, for the president north of the campus, and Jay Nelson lived there. He may have only lived there three years. And then when he retired and left, and they hired the new president, uh, Dale Kogel, the home was not adequate for his needs because he had children at home. And as I recall, and I never was in the home, but it only had a couple of bedrooms, maybe. And so it was decided that uh, they would have to find another home for the president. And because Dale's home was in Ogden and he could commute initially, he commuted, his family stayed in Ogden and he commuted until the construction trades program built another home over in West Murray that was large enough to accommodate his family needs and also to accommodate the needs of a president. And at that time, the regents were stressing more and more that the president should get involved in entertaining as a part of the job. And so when I moved to the college in 81, in fact, I almost did not move into a home owned by the college because although uh, my predecessor, Jay Co or, or Dale Kogel, was gone, his wife was still living in the home with her family. And then I moved into that home that was built by construction trades, but in the process of being hired, the regents asked me if I would either buy or build a home that really was the kind of a, of a home that lent itself to the entertaining that they wanted the president to do. So when I first came to the college, I looked at all of the homes within a mile or two of here that I was aware of or was made aware of uh, through the staff and decided that there wasn't a home that really met the needs. What it needed was a large area for entertaining. It needed to be designed in such a way that, that uh, foot traffic was compatible. Uh, the home that we moved into when I first moved here was on <coughs> three different levels. And so when we'd have a large group in, it wasn't a large group, it was three different groups constantly changing and a narrow stairway so that people had difficulty. And you'd, anyone that was there would remember. Yes, so we designed, my wife and I worked with the architect and the architect for the home. Uh, well, we finally found a location. We found the, the lot over where the house was finally built the college purchased that home, at the same time purchased a number of other lots and built construction trades homes on them in the area. And then as we looked for an architect, it was recommended that we take an architect that was a full-time staff member at the college teaching uh, architectural design and related courses. His name was Johnson. George, George Johnson. And uh, uh, Colleen and I worked with him to give him some ideas we had because I'd already been a college president three times and had some experience and so we told him the kinds of things that we thought should be included and he developed the design. And, but the construction trades class was to build the home. And due to things that I never was fully aware of, not, didn't fully understand, there were hangups and delays and uh, the construction trades had a class that had to have things to do to learn what they were here to learn and so the basement was dug and put in 
and then the rest of the design was not yet available to build the rest of the home and there were delays and the home sat through part of a winter. The students worked fall quarter and nothing was done. It was just a uh, garbage collector from the wind. And in the spring, when we started into it again, the construction trade students couldn't build their schedule and the teachers were hesitant to build it around that home. And so it was decided that the home would be built by outside contractors, subcontractors. And Paul Gunderson, who was the director of plant operations, would be the general contractor. At least he, would, he and his staff would handle the process with the subcontractors to build it. And in the course of that, it ended up costing more by, I don't know, I think it was $30,000 more than what we had planned for it to cost. But the controversy, and there was a tremendous controversy, in fact, I thought it would cost me my job at one point, was because of the rumors and the misinformation that accompanied the process. There were those on campus who were unhappy with some of the changes that I wanted to make because it interfered with what they would like to see continue in programs and in other things at the college. And uh, th as a result of what had occurred with the short term of the previous president, uh, Dale Kogel, uh, there were those on campus, faculty and perhaps some staff, who had become quite involved in the effort to change presidents. And when I came aboard, in fact, one of them told me very specifically, he said, we now know how to get rid of presidents who don't do what we want them to. <laughs> and so they exerted efforts and tied that in with the president's home, which was a controversial thing anyway, because the regents couldn't decide whether presidents should live in their own home or they should live in a home owned by the, the college and thus have the college dictate more specifically what they would do with their home and how it would be used. And as had perhaps been the case previous to me, the, those on campus that wanted to cause a stir went to the media and went to legislators to put the pressure on to force some decisions where they wanted a different decision and I did. On I can't re even remember any specific issues, but I was quite insistent on some changes and there were a number of people who didn't want to change. And uh, so at one point, uh, a senator who no longer is in the Senate asked for an audit by the legislative auditor general. And the legislative audit committee approved it. And once that was announced, the media uh, publicized it a great deal. And I think somewhat inappropriately, one uh, newspaper, daily newspaper, published an anonymous list of complaints of things that were being done wrong at the college. And the, the upshot was, well, one of the things that was mentioned is that the president was billing himself a home worth a million dollars. And I thought, boy, great, I can do some things I wasn't planning to do. <laughs> the initial intent was that the home remain under $200,000. And the final analysis, I think it cost 230000 because of the additional cost for hiring contractors to finish it. But when the Auditor General sent his staff on campus, there still was in the news media the suggestion that the home had cost the college 500000 to a million dollars. And it took him six weeks to do his job. That was a long six weeks for me. At the end of the six weeks, I was totally absolved of any wrongdoing, either in the way that was done or in the amount spent on it, and in all of the other accusations that went with it. 
The Auditor General totally absolved me of that, but somehow the information that got into the news media and on the front page initially uh, was not repeated at the end of it, and I think it was the 38th page of one of the newspapers where they reported that I had been absolved of that whole issue. And that's always the way. Yes. And that is the way, and it created problems for the college, for me, in working through those with not the people on campus, but because the people on campus knew that the issue had been resolved and had resol been resolved to my satisfaction. But even today, and this is now eight to ten years later, because I am now in the legislature, I've had people approach me and, and they still have misconceptions because their conception is built entirely on what they read in the media. So that was a, quite an episode. Uh, it caused problems at the college that it took us, even internally, three or four years at least to resolve. And perhaps the final resolution was only when some of those who were the cause of it either left the college through retirement or through other means, other ways, went elsewhere perhaps. So that was, that was one of the less enjoyable uh, episodes that I had. But it, but it was worth it for the home. It's a tremendous home. It's designed. It's now, even in the neighborhood, there are homes larger and more expensive. And it may be one of the least expensive homes that a president lives in in the Utah system of higher education. Certainly the college that we were always uh, equated most closely with, what's now called Utah Valley State College, they have a president home of greater value, but it has been built subsequent to that. Well, as long as we're talking about those sorts of things, uh, and I, I realize that uh, the responsibilities of a president are multitude, but could you give us some idea, perhaps, of a of a typical day in the life of the uh, college president, uh, including perhaps uh, this business of entertaining. Who would you entertain and why? Well, I didn't know who it was intended that a college president entertain at a community college. I did a great deal of entertaining as the president of a four-year college in Cedar City. and. Uh, Typically, that's members, prominent members of the community, members of the legislature who needed influencing uh, or that we wanted to influence in behalf of the, of the school. I learned very quickly that it did not include entertaining regents because they said very clearly, we, we ask you not to invite regents to your home. Uh, Members of what we call the Institutional Council, now called the Board of Trustees, were not invited as a group, but they were always included with groups of community people. In fact, a typical group, we would try to pick 10 or 12 people, maybe six or seven with their spouses, uh, to come for an evening at the president's home. And we'd try to mix that. We'd try to get community leaders, uh, perhaps a legislator or two, a board of trustees member or two, uh, and then have them there so that we could tell them and maybe show them through a video or something things that we wanted them to be aware of about the college. The biggest problem the college had in all my nine years much greater when I first came than when I left was visibility, was to help the community understand what the, that first that we were a college and then what the college was here for. And in fact, one of the first issues that I faced was when we decided to put this reader board sign out in front and we got resistance surprisingly from the state building board staff. There was an architect that came and insisted 
that that was destroying the image of the college to put a reader board out in front of it. Something that, by the way, exists on most of the colleges in the state now. But uh, they were saying we were commercializing the college, and I was saying that's exactly right because that's the intention. This college is to meet the needs of the commercial part of the state. And we want to use some of the very things that we teach students to help them use. And that's uh, visible things, projecting ourselves, marketing ourselves as a college. And we had to do that. I had neighbors who drove past the front of this college for years on Redwood Road and saw it over here and didn't really know what it was. One of the reasons is the sign was done in such a way that if you drove by and glanced over, you couldn't read it. The contrast between the letters and the background was not such that they knew what we were. And with that reader board in out, out in front when it was finally established, changed the world for us. When I first came to the college, only 13% of our students were right out of high school. All of the rest of them were older students that had at least three or four or five years out of high school or past high school age. And we wanted to attract those young students that didn't want to go on to college, especially those that wanted to get into a career preparation program. And that reader board did more than anything else uh, initially to attract those students. The two factors that had the greatest influence finally, though, were, were starting a basketball team and changing the name to Salt Lake Community College. But back to the issue of, of uh, those things that, that occurred at that time to help the college. Now I've lost my line of thought. Well, uh, you were talking of cart. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. okay, I talked a little bit about entertaining. I don't think a college president has a typical day. For instance, I visited just recently with President Bud, and what he does now is significantly different than what I typically did. But because I, the best part of the day for me is mornings, I function better in the mornings than in the afternoons. I typically got at the college uh, before 8 o'clock, sometimes quite a bit earlier, when I could have time to myself to prepare myself for the day. But most days included a, a lot of meetings, meetings with faculty or faculty groups, meetings with community groups, and increasingly, meetings having to do with the legislature, either with legislators or with staff of the legislature, like uh, the uh, analysts, legislative analysts, or with others working on items that, would, that had to be resolved by the legislature. And then in addition to that, and perhaps my entertaining I would include with entertaining, not just the evening entertaining in my home or with larger groups here at the college, I would include the luncheons because very few weeks that I didn't have at least three luncheons scheduled. We scheduled a lot of luncheons with businessmen, three to five, no more than seven at a time. And Bert Talmage, who became the director of the development and foundation part of the college when we formed that after I came, was the person who organized these. In fact, a little anecdote that I'll never forget, Bert loved French dip sandwiches. And when I finally said to Bert that maybe we should get something else occasionally for lunch, uh, my secretary told me we had had 23 lunches with French dip sandwiches. <laughs> because we'd have, at least once a week and sometimes twice a week, we'd have a group of people in. And we were getting the foundation started and so we were then interested in identifying people who might make contributions to the foundation to help the college in that respect. And so we were combining a lot of things together 
uh, in selling the college and making the college visible and making people understand what the college was. So my day typically would start sometime before 8 o'clock. I would go home sometime after 4.30, which usually ended the day for most people at the college. But two or three or sometimes five evenings, I would have commitments either in my home or back over here at the college or somewhere else in connection with my job. And so a president's day, I would say there were few weeks during the nine years that I was president that I didn't put in 70 to 80 hours doing one kind of thing or another, and I'm sure the president does at least that much now. But it was not typical. Many times I would get a call saying that a TV station wanted to interview me. And they'd come, up, come and set up in my office or out on the lawn, wherever they preferred to do it. And I'd have an interview. And before it, I got to where I always asked for a briefing, either by Jay Williams or uh, Brian Gardner or someone else to remind me again of how to handle it such that I wouldn't say something they could pull out of context that would be misleading as to what I intended. So I developed those habits fairly carefully and I would have notes to remind myself uh, and we would tape them ourselves, all of them. Not that we were more mistrustful than someone else, but that we became increasing mistrustful because occasionally an investigative reporter that would come along that would abuse the uh, privileges of the press. And that was a big concern. And that was something that I spent a quite a bit of time. In fact, we had classes. We had people come in and teach us things that we should be aware of how we should approach it, what kinds of things to say. So it was a matter of being educated as much as, as uh, in a different way perhaps, but as much as students on campus, constantly. So the, the day, although it was very atypical, it always included many kinds of meetings. I was quite aggressive in trying to get either a faculty senate or a college senate up and functioning in a very good way because I always believed that the best way for the college to succeed was to have as much input from as many members of the staff, faculty, and other staff as we possibly could in some organized way. And a lot of time was spent doing that. I also was a member of a, a civic club. I was a member of Rotary, Rotary and in fact president of one of the years and then it met off campus. Now the, the Valley West Rotary meets on campus every Wednesday, I believe, still. And in fact, it was when I was president that we changed the name to Valley West from Granger because many people didn't know there was a Granger at one time just north of us here. So the day was atypical. Even from one day to the next, I could not plan definitely what my day would be. So many new things came up and many times I'd have to reschedule things that I had already scheduled, meetings and appointments. I spent a lot of my time with people, although I didn't have as much of an open door policy as people or presidents are encouraged to do. I would have five or six or 10 people a day at least in my office on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal appointment. And then, uh, just many, many unexpected things. When I could, and I remembered, or my secretary uh, reminded me, I'd go back to uh, the philosophy of administrating, I forget the exact term, by walking around. Wandering around. Wandering around, yes. Because I felt it was important to get out where I could talk to faculty and staff. Not my interest was not in having them have a chance to talk to me. Mine was in having me have a chance to talk with them in an informal setting. It's interesting you comment on that because uh, one of the criticisms from faculty and staff was that you are at your best one on one, and yet they seldom got to see you one on one. 
and that uh, that rankled many people. But as you explain it, your time often didn't allow for that. In generalities, I would say that when I first became president of the college, I was spending 10 or 15 percent of my time involved in legislative related activities. Nine years later when I left the college I was spending probably 60 or 65 percent of my time in issues related to that. And so it was forcing more and more of my time to be spent off campus. And I knew of those criticisms uh, and they were legitimate ones. I'm sure the president today faces the same kinds of issues that he does not have the time to spend with individuals as much as they wanted and, and as much as he wanted. The other kinds of changes, I spent more time with system issues as the President's Council became more involved and as the Regent's Office became more involved in legislative issues. When I first came to the college, we did not have a person assigned to work with the legislature. When I hired my assistant within months after I came, the first assignment I gave him was to become involved with the legislature. And then three years later, he became a legislator. And after he left, we then had a person whose primary responsibility was working with the legislature. But even with all of that, as president, I could not avoid the increasing amount of time that, that I thought was necessary and I still think is necessary since all of our money, all of the college's money comes from the legislature. Even the tuition collected from students goes back to the state and then comes to the college as a part of the appropriations budget from the legislature. And so since they were our uh, they were the keeper of the, the finances, and, and so that changed. And then the role changed. One of the major issues that I wrestled with, not just here, but especially here, was that the college was destroying all of its vocational programs and putting in college transfer programs, and I'm sure that's still an issue. And I've recently seen statistics to show that even since I left the college, the number of programs, applied technology as it's now called, has increased significantly. But it's also true that the students coming for general education and with the intent of transferring to a four-year college are a much greater percentage of the total student body than they were then. And those in those programs, the instructors and others involved in it, and those at the state level interested in applied technology and those in the legislature interested in applied technology continued to criticize the college because we were even trying to get a, any classes that were not aimed specifically at job preparation. And that's where I coined initially the term Model T vocational education because some of those people wanted us to continue doing it just exactly like it was done and then they were talking about the way it was done in the 50s, <laughs> not the 70s, yeah. and especially not the 90s. Changing the subject somewhat, you've alluded a couple of times today to uh, basketball and athletics. How did that all come about? Prior to your time, if, if we had a game of tiddlywinks, that would be really <laughs> something. The college had a basketball team before my time. When the college was located down at uh, uh, 4th South and 6th East. And uh, old timers maybe can remember it. They discontinued it because of the tremendous pressure from the State Board of Education saying that was not appropriate for a technical school. And when I first came to the college, there were those who wanted to continue it. There was tremendous pressure in opposition to it from legislators, from regents, and from our, even from our own institutional council. 
and yet we wanted a program that would expand on the physical education. There were some that didn't even think the college should have physical education classes because we weren't interested in that kind of thing. The shop was enough exercise or all, all kinds of excuses. But I started my teaching career in a, a major to be a coach. Had some interest in it. I played basketball for 10 years, not all in high school. And uh, so I had an interest, not just in basketball, although that was the primary area of interest. Baseball was perhaps the, the next most interesting. And finally, uh, w there were those when they saw that we were showing interest saying if you go into a sport like basketball, then it needs to be not just a men's sport, but uh, also women's sports. And finally, we had people on campus and off campus who said, we are willing to finance this with non-state money if you will finally agree to it. And if you talk about starting on a shoestring, we started on a shoestring, and it was a shoestring longer than those that tie basketball shoes. And the first year that we finally decided, we got tremendous resistance, but we started a team. We, had, we didn't even have a basketball gym to play in. And so they, they played where they could. We had a, an ex-NBA uh, uh, player to coach the team. And we had a, a fellow out in, from Magna, had an up and going business who would make the jerseys for us because that was his business. And we did everything we possibly could, and we had a team for a whole year with no state support. We didn't even put college support into it except the money that was raised from private sources. And we had a team that was a great team. It was so good that, I don't know, we, we may have come in third in the, in the league that year. Surprised a lot of people, but it really developed support for it. Enough so that we started telling these folks, if you want a basketball team, you go and talk to, to board members. You go and talk to regents. And you go and talk to legislators who are opposed to it. And that's how it started. And the second year was tougher than the first because we had to do some expanding. And our ability to attract players was not the greatest because we weren't even a farm team. <laughs> Although finally we, had, we were approached by a couple of universities saying, we've got some players that we can't get on our program. We'd like them to come and play for you this year and then maybe come for us next year. And that's how it started. But the support came, really came. And so after that first year, we, we committed school funds beyond what could be raised privately and ran the, the resistance to that, the open resistance to it, and each year expanded a little more. But even when I left in 90, you couldn't call the support for the athletic program much more than shoestring support because of the limitations that may now even now exist. And that's why this last weekend I was delighted to see that uh, SLCC took the conference and will go to Kansas or wherever they play it this year. But you, you did uh, not only get a, um, a coach, but you got an athletic director. Yes, and, and the athletic director we were able to justify uh, through regular funds because of our expanding PE program. And so we got an athletic director as quickly, really, as we got a coach. The first athletic director was the fellow, and I don't recall his name even now, from out in West Valley that came and put a lot of his time and his money, a lot of it, into the program. So it, and it's, and it's progressing well. I, I don't recall, we were looking at getting into baseball. Uh, did looking at some golf, some other things, but as far as I know, I still I'm interested in the basketball and, and follow that. 
But that helped. That helped in a lot of ways. It gave us visibility, not just to potential students, but to the whole, not just the valley, but the state. And so it was good for the college. I think it paid dividends to the college and will continue to do so. Although, if there are still those on campus wanting us to get a football team, I would still resist that. I understand. Well, you talk of athletics being uh, uh, good for the school, certainly in public relations and visibility. Uh, would you make any comments about the community theater? Oh, yes. Program and, and how did that evolve and, and uh, is that having a like effect? As a matter of fact, I was every bit as interested in having the college get involved in that kind of program as I was athletics. I was not as directly involved in getting it started. It was, again, people at the college, uh, like the many years that the travel program ran here, and others who were constantly doing the kinds of things that could be done to have uh, various arts, the dramatic arts, the uh, musical music and other kinds of things. But what really kicked it into gear was some people who were full-time members of the campus and a program that got picked up and was going uh, with uh, skill center people combined with those here at the college. And when we got South High with its auditorium, and they knew we were going to get South High, the effort really, the encouragement really expanded. And my only contribution probably was to find some money to put into it, again, a shoestring type thing, to start getting some things into place. And the biggest thing was to, to pay a person as a part of their job to organize the process. And, and although much of it was to do with the dramatic arts, it also had to do with singing groups and other things. And when we hired our first teacher to teach music, in fact, I went to an auction when the, the South High School was being closed. They auctioned off a lot of things. And because I like auctions, and that's another story entirely, I bought two grand pianos that were in tough, looked very bad, but the music was good, I was told, and so I bought from auction two, two pianos for the college that we then had redone. And I hope they've expanded far beyond that now. And I've attended some of the, the things that the college does now in the way of, of the arts and I think it's progressing very well. With the basketball program, most, I think, is owed to those on campus who are willing to put in the additional time and effort and finances even to get it started. That is especially true with all of the arts, various arts programs that were started and, then, and are now in place now. People who committed their time and their talents and everything else. By your definition, do you then uh, uh, regard Salt Lake Community College now as a comprehensive community college, full-fledged? Well, it's hard to, divide, to define what's full-fledged, but I would say by the time we changed our name to Salt Lake Community College, we fully met the definition of a comprehensive community college. There were lots of things we didn't do, some of which have been started since, but one of the aspects of a comprehensive community college is to add only those things that really are needed or benefit the community. And yes, it's a comprehensive community college. The one last thing to put in place that I would like to see happen is to have the more than one full-fledged campus. Pretty close. Closer. Yeah. Well, uh, you now are, um, amongst many other things, you are a, 
a legislator, a member of the State House of Representatives, and you're seeing things from, from the other side of the coin. Yes. Uh, as you reflect back on the positive and negatives of the legislature and, and uh, working with, with college presidents, how do you feel about, uh, about the legislature? Is it, uh, do, do you really feel that, that the members of that group work uh, for the, the institutions of higher education? Or? The legislature, like the state of Utah, is very pro-education, generally speaking. Many legislators, as with many others in the state, have a somewhat narrow perspective of education that, in which they are interested. But uh, generally speaking, I see a lot of support. After having spent two years in the House of Representatives, I am more impressed with the commitment that I see. There are some, as in all organizations, there are some who, whose goals and purpose for being in the legislature may not be what I would think they should be. But I came in with one of the largest new freshman classes of the legislature that has occurred in a number of years. And out of that, almost 40 new members of the House, I'm extremely impressed with the commitment to the dedication, the sincerity, and the interest that I see. I have to say that in my opinion, this year, higher education did not fare as well as it should have in the final analysis of funds being uh, distributed by the legislature. But they still fared well, comparatively speaking. Public education fared better than they did. But generally speaking, they did, they did very well and uh, will continue to do so, in my opinion. We need, we need to stop. The class is waiting. Oh, oh okay. okay.